Austin Blues talking, Henry's Blues House. Um, Sarah's filming again, you can go on YouTube. Remember, in order to browse through YouTube, there's really nice people talking, prattling on about the blues in the past. It's really an interesting visit. Well, tonight's guest is someone who featured heavily um, quite recently in an interview with Laurie Hornsby, because everything Laurie Hornsby's done seems to be with this guitar player, singer, songwriter, John Caswell. Hello, John. Um, John Caswell and I, we sort of go back a long way, but our careers have sort of lurched in and out. We, we had quite an intensive relationship in 79, was it maybe? No, no, it was 69. 69, 69. Yeah. And uh, but John, but actually, yeah. John's done a lot before that and a lot after that. So um, let's start off from the beginning. You've got, you got a real good start in life because your dad led an eight piece band. That's right. Uh, and his name is John Caswell, funnily enough. Uh, well, I've never been called John Caswell Jr. in fact. But, uh, yeah, and he ran the 50s and 60s. He had a, a dance band. And I learned to play guitar basically in my dad's dance band. So it's come in handy over the years because I've, I've learned all the standards. Uh, that a lot of people nowadays wouldn't know. I knew because my my dad taught them to me in his dance band. And then, from, and that was about, about 64, 65, I suppose. Then he started, and, and although the Beatles were happy, I liked the Beatles, but I was never really uh, that turned on by it. And it all began for me, really, when I heard John Mayles' Blues Breakers. Uh, and, the, the fantastic album uh, featuring Eric Clapton with all the classic songs on it. And I, I wore it out. I had the album and I wore it out. Since I bought another copy, it's in mint <laughs> condition, which is like priceless you know, because of money. But uh, apparently, people like Sting learned to play the guitar listening to that album. And then me and a few friends started to muck around and get a band. And the first band was really a band called King Biscuit Blues. Not the, not the American one, a Birmingham bunch of guys. And there was this young guitar player who played, we were the first double guitar band. And a guy called Ted Turner, who later was in Wishbone Ash, uh, came from Chelmsley Wood, otherwise Swan. And, uh, and I used to teach him some of the chords because he could play great guitar but he couldn't play the chords properly and of course I had all that knowledge from the dance band and, uh, and we'd done that for a few months and then uh, and we used to go and watch John Heisman's Coliseum with Dick Hexel Smith uh, who were like real old blues stalwarts and uh, John Heisman uh, used to say do you want to get up boys? you know and I used to know them, and Ted was always got up and, and had a play with them. I think at the time they were to play with a guy called um, James Little and James Little and Smith. Or something like that. I don't remember Smith, but certainly James Little. Yes. And yes. And, uh, and so, and then uh, me and Ted didn't see so much of each other because we obviously grew up. And he went up and he, he found me up one day, so it's great. Uh, interview with the band called Wishbone Nash. And, and, uh, and that was the last I did for about five years. So he was a superstar. Can I go back a bit? Yes. What, what did your father play? Piano. Right, so it's a good man to teach you the basics. I was, he's a brilliant piano player. He, he, he'd, um, before the war, he, he'd done City and Guilds, and he wanted to be a concert pianist, and then he could he could read one of the tests for City and Girls in those days was they put a piece of music front in front of you upside down, you had to play it. So you had to transpose it from being upside down and playing like a sort of test. And uh, and he was like a brilliant piano player and it was like I couldn't have had more or encouragement or uh, a better musical education than we had. And all his friends. Musician, 
really on my side. And so funny, and funny enough, yes, I just let me this. Funny enough, he's a drummer with a guy called um, uh, Millwood, and his son is Nick Millwood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So tell me, who chose the guitar, you or your dad? Well, I sort of chose it. Um, because I knew that I wanted a Gibson, because that's what Eric Clapton had, and all the blues artists like Peter Green had, and I wanted a, I wanted a Gibson. And uh, I managed to get, there was a shop in Birmingham, uh, it was called Midway Music, and Ken Inglefield, who was just being the Jerry Allen trio, uh, had, a, had, had guitars. And, uh, and I bought uh, an old Gibson SG Junior, which is a long pickup guitar. And I bought it for 70 pounds, which is laughable now because they're better for you. And, um, and that's where the guitars first began. Then when I was in, sorry I'm jumping a bit, then when I was in locomotive, so I was coming a bit quick, there was a crash with one of my guitars. And it broke it up and you. Uh, as a manager, when he said, go and get another guitar, I would have bought a Stratocaster. And that was in the same as most other people, as we all find Stratocasters and most of the other I'm not finished with your dad yet. Oh, come on, yeah, yeah. So, how old were you when you actually got your first guitar? Uh, about 10. So, how old were you when you first played in public with your dad? Probably about 14. Great. Because I, like a lot of young kids now, once I got the bug, I, I used to, I tell you what my regime was that was self-inflicted. Where most of my friends were going out and playing football after school. When I was like 12, 13, 14, I lived about two minutes from the school. And I was always like, and I used to, Get up in the morning, play for half an hour, have my breakfast, go to school, come home at lunchtime, play for another hour, another lunchtime, eat a Saturday, go back to school, come back at four o'clock, play till six o'clock, uh, have my tea, um, then play for another two or three hours, go to bed. And I've done that every day for about five years, or four or five years. And I learned, so I learned very quickly, and I had all the encouragement of my father. Because he, he, he loved the fact that his son was going to, you know, following his footsteps. As he well, and my brother, my brother also could play the guitar. Younger brother, yeah. younger brother, but and he was excellent. But he just he kind of like didn't get him like me, and uh, he was more interested in chasing girls, minis, yeah. mini cars. I think it's very interesting that uh, you Alan Barnes always splutters with indignation when I talk to him. He says, that girl just said to me, I wish I could play as well as you do. And he says, well, go away and practice for six hours a day. That's it. <laughs> it's it. it. Well, when I, you work at it, you get well, good. Well, when I was um, a guitar teacher, doing private lessons for a few years, I always used to teach, and this is absolutely bang on for any guitar teacher that might hear this or pupil. It's it's 10% knowledge and 90% practice. And that's the truth. Because once you've got the knowledge, then it's up to you. How good you get? And it's, it's the best. That's it. Can I interrupt you with a totally irrelevant story, which backs up what you say? There's a very nice story, which I'm, I really hope is true. Clark Terry, one of my favourite ever jazz trumpet players, was stopped on uh, Carnegie, sorry, on 52nd Street, by a tourist, tourist couple who had said, Excuse me, young man. Um, can you tell me how to get to Carnegie Hall? He said, oh, practice, man, practice. <laughs> That's true. So, um, I never thought he was a blues man, It's really interesting to know that John Mayer had a great influence on you, because yeah, he was a very important band. Oh, yeah, he was. A, and, and also, where, where this leads to is like going back to those early days. I used to go to Henry's Blues House, but the original Henry's Blues House. Uh, in the uh, Hill Street, and I used to go. And the, uh, the band there at the time, the house band, was a guy called Clem Clems and Dave Clems. And I used to get up with him sometimes and play. 
And I actually did solo gigs there with Diz Diz Lee. And uh, we're going back a long time, um, going back to like, the, the, the 60, like 67, 68. 68, yeah. How old were you then? Well, I've been on. It's been hot company for 18 years, isn't it? Yeah, it's hot company, yeah. But, but, yeah. 18 years. I mean, it's, people say you've got lots of stories, and I go, well, I can't help you, I'm old. <laughs> but, I mean, one of the ones was, and of course we used to play around the town in Birmingham, and there used to be another club in the, called the Metro. And one night, Big Bear, uh, who were looking after Black Sabbath as well, sent us locomotive when we were in this kind of change from locomotive to a dog of people. Sent us to play at this club. And it was like a Tuesday night or a Thursday night. And the two bands that they had that night was the original Black Sabbath and the original Locomotive. And uh, we carried each other's gear and they carried each other's gear out. And the fee for both bands for the night was 30 quid. They got 15 quid and so did we. Well, that's how it was in the night. Um, and, and, and you know, so when people start marrying about this and that, that's, we're not talking a hundred years ago, we're talking like late 60s, just before 70s. Ago. So did you play with any bands that were, you might have tell us about, between playing with your dad and joining Local Who do you play well, with well, in just like, I, I, I've always been um, a bit of a gun for hire. Uh, by that I mean, somebody phoned me and said, Johnny, will you come and play with us? I'd go, yeah, if you bother me. And, um, and that was basically how it was. And so there's not been blase, but there was lots of bands that I can't remember. Because it was a long time ago. Uh, but that's what I, I, I used to do. And then I went into different fields of music as well. So I started off playing blues. And then I, for a long time I was one of the top country guitar players. And, and I used to do all that country rock stuff and you know, the, all that Albert Lee kind of thing. And then I played with other bands like Raymond Froggy, and Sarah, and Sarah Jury, a fantastic and steel player. Uh, and, and little Ginny and Rue service, that was another band from London. And uh, these bands, they were of such a, a level. They played with a lot of American stars. And I'd done tours with Glenn Campbell, Tammy Winnett. And so I met all these people as well, and all these musicians. And I learned a lot. I was, to be honest, I was like a sponge. Because that's the only way you learn, just keep your ears open and, and take it all in. And, uh, and so that's what it. You know, I did. And then I used to do odd gigs with Steve Gibbons band. And um, where have we got to? <laughs> well, can I, can I sort of take it over for a second? Um, I can't remember the details, so I'm really fascinated with what you're talking about. With Locomotive. Well, you were there for most of it. No, no, no. But had a been on the road for about eight years with different lineups, different singers. The last singer we had was called Norman Haynes, and he took the band in a different direction, which I didn't really like. And um, now Frankie Spencer. Frankie Spencer. Yeah. I'll go come on to him. Come on, really so Lucky Bunty sort of had a split. Uh, we had a, a hit with Who Does In Love, a nice cheery rock steady song. Then EMI and Tony Hall were recruited by Norman Haynes to support him, and I got voted down. And they went with a song called Mr. Armageddon, which was heavy and doomy and gloomy and very, very good. But it was it alienated the Lugmoney fans because they had they had buying a record that was light and cheery. So we split and to, and uh, Norman Haynes went off and formed a band called uh, Norman Haynes Band, the later called Sacrifice, um, which gives you an idea of where they were going. Where we tried to reform the locomotive. And where Frankie Spencer of one vocal, how did we get hold of you and how did we get hold of Keith Mill, wasn't it? Yeah. We retained the bass and drums, we retained uh, Bob Lamb on drums and Mick Hinks from Locomotive. The other ones were Doc Norman, and we finished up with, with a really good band um, trying to fill their shoes, which was a bit 
to be a stretch because the front man was so different. But how do we how do we encounter you? So how did I find you? Um, I was doing a gig in Bartley Green College with a band called Dandelion. Yeah, remember that? Yeah. And, uh, and you know what? Did they play Chris? I can't remember. And uh, uh, with the band called Dandelion. And, um, and I remember in the sound check, uh, loco uh, Locomotive were doing their sound check. And I got up with the, the guitar player, because I was a singer in the Dandelion. I wasn't playing guitar, I was just standing there with the microphone, seeing, you know, you'd try anything once, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and I was just singing, so I got up with the, the guitar player's guitar at, at the Dandelion and started jamming with Locomotive. And it went on and on and on. And, uh, and then we all done our gigs and went on. And then the, the, that was on a weekend. And then on the Monday morning, I think Jim was in the car and said, we're, we're looking for a new singer or whatever, a guitar player. Will you come out and audition? And I went, yeah. And, uh, and I didn't have a guitar. I had to borrow a, a, a 335. This guy is in fact. It's a Gibson 335. And uh, I went this and I got the job. So the next thing I knew, I was off with a <coughs> locomotive to play in Germany, a place called Trier, I think it was. Yeah. He's up France, probably France. No, it's Germany. Germany. Yeah. And, uh, and that's basically how I was in locomotive. <coughs> and then. We were always on the cusp of going from being a, a ska band to uh, a, a prog rock band, if you like. And of course, I, I, I take what you say. People used to come to see Rudy's in love, and we'd be doing obscure, like, spirit songs, and they? they hated us. And because, only because they, we were like the, totally the wrong band that they thought we were. And, um, and then, <coughs> then we, got, we had another single called Roll Over Mary. That was later. That was it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then we... Uh, we, got two, we got banned from the airways, remember that? Sorry? We got banned from the airways. No, I don't. We did? did we? I don't know. Roll Over Mary. Some, some journalist in Disc Music Echo wrote that it was um, a song about... Um, it was a sexual innuendo song about Mary Magdalena and Jesus Christ. And they took us right off the airways. And it wasn't at all. I mean, no, it wasn't at all. He was getting radio, getting radio play. Just from it. And they just kept it. Was written by Keith Billy, who was an orange. And that's all I remember. Uh, we'll have a look at it. It'll be a hit, right? <coughs> but anyway, on the strength of that, we got uh, an album at, at Abbey Road, which in them days was a world thing. Well, you know, go and do an album, The Beatles Street. I mean, sometimes the book was there, so it was like... Phew. So who was at the back of the studio all, all day the first day there? You remember? And was it? George Harrison. George Hampton, yeah. Right. Right. And sat there behind and, 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 and who knows what he nicked? And uh, <laughs> what about <laughs> No, him. Oh, George <laughs> Harrison. And, uh, and, uh, my mate, Bob Wilson, who just wanted to call him, he... He drove us down there to, to Abbey Road. What was your road? It's our road. He was like one of the best guitar players in the area. But he drove us down there, and I think just to walk across the crossing. And, um, Come on, forget, forget about guitar playing. Right. How good a driver was he? I can't remember. And, uh, and so we, and we done this, and we done this album, and all of a sudden, we were like um, a prog rock band. And, and we weren't bad, and, and we done it for, and we done that for a while. But you we didn't have a lot of regular. You used to do that the name change. Sorry. The name change. Yeah. So you, point we you, you, you thought of the name. Yeah. From a book by James Thurber. Tell me about that. Tell me. Yeah. I read a book about James Thurber. He writes brilliantly about dogs. It's amazing because he's blind, so I don't know how he gets his commentary. But um, we decided that exactly as John said, the audience the band were playing great. They were tremendous. But they also weren't liking it because the wrong audience came. So we decided to change it into something kind of cool and hip and proggy. 
We call it the, the dog that bit people. <laughs> but for that too loud, I went on mine today, knowing that's going to talk to John. And there's a, I found a dog that bit people album. The original one that we did, yeah. I produced the thing in, in, in Abbey Road. Um, the original album was on Sassafone on sale today. Guess the price. Well, I know, because I know what they, what they go for. 445 pounds. <coughs> And the and the, the one. And, and also if you look a bit further, if you can buy an original Mark and Mighty Bar, it's a thousand pounds. Really? Yes. And a lot of the reason is because that they were made in the year, era in London. And especially a dog of people because it was recorded at Abbey Road, so it's a collector's item for that alone. And yeah. so anyway. So we, we, we can't Excuse me. Sorry. I've got to the Donna Bitcoin the album. I've got to review. Logan Lee said, Elegant Progressive Rock. That's that, eh? Um, there was one song which you had your hand in writing. I've got the album. album. You were involved in um, Monkey and the Sailor. Yes. Yeah. Lovely Lady. Yes. It's not exactly your blues, is it, eh? Cover me in roses. You don't sing some lines. No, I can't see that. A snaps of a rex, which I think is about a dog, wasn't it? Yeah, but it was kind of like in keeping with the dog with big people. Exactly. But the strange thing about that is that this is this is a true story. This is showing you the, the cheek of it. We're sitting in Abbey Road, and the engineer, who was also the Holly's engineer, or something like that, said you need to do another song. And I'd just broken the top E string on the guitar and I didn't have the spare. And, I, and we played, recorded that song with no top E string on the guitar. And so I had to play the solo on five strings on the guitar. And we did it and so And it's like, and it sounds all right. That's great. And Mr. Sunshine. Yeah, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Walking? Yeah, yeah. I wrote all of these, of course I know, yeah. And there's one, it's a tribute to Black Sabbath. It's a tribute to the wrong word. No, it's, it's close enough. <laughs> <laughs> it was a satirical, sneering tribute. I, just, I had just lost the management of Black Seller, so I wouldn't encourage them to be too effusive about this. Reptile bit. man. Reptile man. <laughs> yeah. they, what was the line? They say he comes from Bilston. <laughs> they say he comes from Bilston, but nobody really knows from the far Oh, no, no, no. They say he comes from Bilston. But no one really knows. Yeah. From the fiery holes, it's reptile. The fire oh, was, the fire was a, a pub in Bilston. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, you have to be there. Um, no, it was, uh, a, so, and that was like a motive, and that was the dog that bit people. And, uh, and that's like, you know, so the blues has gone a bit. Like, so yeah. why did the dog that bit people break up? I can't remember. The dog that big people broke up because we didn't get anywhere as all as it's like there were some great bands like all round England that were like um, that never kind of like got anywhere because they run the course and they they didn't know where else to go. Like uh, I know I'm bringing him back into it again, but like Bob was in a band called Tea and Symphony. Yeah, they were great. Now the only reason they backed in was because. In the end, there was nowhere to go. It was like you've run your course. You know, people have, you can only knock on the door so many times. People go, no. And you, you, don't, you want to go and try something else. And that was the reason. The dog that bit people have tremendous reviews. I've read them. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, but the dog that bit people, um, uh, actually, on Radio 1, they played our record, one of the songs, Cover Me Rose. The guy played it and he said, I like that song, I'm going to play it again. So he played it twice. And in latter years, in latter years, in the last five years, I had a guy from Brazil sent me an email saying, is it alright if we do The Monkey and the Sailor? Of the album. And I just went, yeah, go for it. Now can I do a version? And I thought, yeah, it's like some young band that found his old album. And thought, can we do that song? Yeah. The, the common theme in the reviewers was it like a British Crosby Seals National Young. Yeah, we had good harmonies, yeah. I mean, because uh, we all sat, well, me and the Kings, we were very good harmonies. 
and Keith Miller, who um, I suppose Keith Keith claimed to play. He wrote a song called uh, "So You Think You're a Man" by Divine, who was a, a singer guy in London. Yeah. Was, was that right? Yeah, I think it was. Much, he was in St. Louis Union. Yeah. 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 And, and they had some yeah, success with their hit. No the, girl. The, the girl was there. So it's a loose unit, but won some sort of melody maker competition one year. I'm not sure. Yeah. But that had faded by the time we picked it up. I don't know how we got hold of it. You? No. Because he was there when I got there. He came from Manchester, didn't he? Yeah, that's right. He went on to be quite a successful keyboard tech. Like he worked with loads of And he actually and he played in the Steve Gibbons band. Get out of here, really? He did do. Oh, he did briefly, yeah. That's yeah, he right. played he did the band, yeah. When he did a he final did. tour with us, did Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, Bob would have seen him. Him and Nick Pantalone. Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. And so did the drummer. And Bob and Bob 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 Bob. That was when the rock set in when we added keyboards and sacks. <laughs> yeah, he should have kept it to rock and roll. Just guitars, guitars. So, so when a dog that beat people melted, went away, sadly. What did you do next? Did you join oh, the Gibbons? No. I went and played in water for six months. <laughs> I decided to go swimming for me in a white suit. <laughs> we heard this story a few weeks ago from Laurie Hornsby. Yeah. He did uh, mention the white suit. And uh, which the guy the made, story, which, which the guy made over there. Uh, Vladdy the Taylor, yeah, in Valletta. And uh, and then I ended up being in the duo with Laurie Hawkins for many years, going around the country, cabaret clubs, and wearing a shirt with a dicky bow and all that. And then I went back to playing electric guitar in bands. We were actually we we were actually in Scotland one night, and the phone and the phone rang in the hotel room. And Laurie, Laurie was before I witnessed it. The phone rang, and I think it was either Rosa and Black Sabbath or something like that. Tony's not very well. Can you come and do a gig with Black Sabbath? And I went, no. I'm in Scotland. I'm in Scotland. Can you guess of the year that was? Uh, very, very early seventies. I must have been. Laurie would probably. I must have been 71, so yeah. yeah. And uh, and so I, that's why I, I kind of like floundered in that world. <laughs> but mate, you know what's remarkable about this, You correct me if I'm wrong. Mm. I think you've made your entire living throughout your life as a musician. Probably, yeah, yeah. That's pretty. Yeah. Well, that's pretty people unique. Say, people used to say I was a musical yeah. prostitute because I do anything on me. But I. I, I, I <laughs> And then I, I went into country bands and done a lot of country stuff. And uh, Little Ginny and... And it was great when I was with Little Ginny, I got to get on stage with her and the boys and see bring me sunshine. <laughs> and do the dance. Now Sarah's impressed. And, and then yeah, the only boy that's actually said to me, do you know the dance? I said, of course. <laughs> and uh, so I had some really strange moments like that. But you remain as a musician. Yeah, yeah. That's why I'm, I'm very proud I, of the I fact that. I think that's quite unusual, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, it's all from me, my, my father. Really. He, uh, he instilled it into me when I was playing with dance back. That it was a very, and I'm not going to follow that. It, that it was a really noble thing to be. It's an art, like a painter or a writer. Or that. Yes. And a lot of people who don't understand it, who put it. I go, oh, he plays the guitar. But my dad really understood the, the artistry of it because he was almost classically trained. And, and it's really funny because now I tend to find myself listening to a lot of classical music by the foray, not the obvious. And, and I can see the, the beauty of it. Um, Rob, have a word. Four eyes. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, and so um, but then I went and done the country thing. Then I ended up playing with Raymond Frog in his music for a few years, which was a very successful band. Yeah, and uh, and Raymond Frog is a genius, uh, great song. And then 
I left him and I've, and I've, I've been in a session player uh, in London for a while. And then uh, I was actually on holiday in uh, Sorrento and Steve Gibbons found me up and said, can you come and do a gig with us? I said, where are you? He said, Sicily. <laughs> And I said, that's a bit novel, because I just don't know what. And uh, he used to have a guitar player called Jock. And Jock went to live in Sicily. And uh, he'd gone to do some gigs in Sicily with Jock. And, then I, and I said, no, I can't do it, I'm on holiday. Uh, and he said, I want you to play bass. So, and I said, no, I said, no, I can't. And then, anyway, then I ended up playing on an album in 1996. Called Stained Glass with Bob Will. Uh, doing uh, like some of Steve's songs, playing bass. So when he came to do a German tour a few years later, his bass player, who I won't mention because uh, he's a nice guy, let him down. And um, when he found me, he said, Will you come and play bass? on his German tour and I said, well, I'm not really a bass player, but he said, well, you played on that album, you did it, you? I said, all right, yeah, okay. <laughs> and, um, and I went and, um, and, and, and done the tour with him and I came back and as soon as we got back after about two or three weeks, he said, do you want to come and play with The Who next week? <laughs> and I went, yeah, you should have said, who? <laughs> and then, uh, and then we, we were in, suddenly I was in the Isle of Man, which, the Gibbons band used to do all the while. And I was in the Isle of Man with the Who and Paul Carrick on the anniversary, the 100th anniversary. And I've done that. And then I just seemed to stay there <laughs> for the next 10 years or whatever. And um, What about recording, John? What recording did you make? I made my own album. Is that the Vineyards? In Vineyards in Japan, that was a hit in France. And That's a strange band, isn't it? Do you explain it's yourself? I don't know, I can remember a bit down to whiskey. <laughs> but, uh, you told me you only took whiskey for medicinal purposes. Yeah, but this is going back a long time and it used to be a bit more fun. But uh, it, it was a video in Japan. I had an album. It's re the cover of the album cost 15,000 pounds a pound to get the permission from the uh, British Museum to use that photograph. What's which I did have to find. What's the inspiration behind the titles? Well, it was a, it, 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 this is like about 1980 now, and and it was the everything was getting was Uber 40 ish and reggae, and because Bob Lamb had I'd been in a band with Bob Lamb, um, like going back in time, I went to his studio and we made an album that was reggae basically, catching in if you want. And, um, and so we, we did it, and um, next thing I know was that uh, In This Land, which was the, the lead song of it, was a hit on the continent. And then all of a sudden I was in the Palais in Paris by Maxine, doing a gig, and, uh, and Bob Wilson was in the band for a while, playing when, when he could, he was a guitar player. I didn't come to Paris though, did I? But it wasn't my fault. Why didn't you come to and, Paris? Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the King George the Sixth or whatever you <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I did that, and then, um, uh, but, and that was kind of, right, and what? And I was supposed to be doing a big gig with Cool and the gang, as, as the support, obviously. And what kind of ruined my career was the night that I was supposed to go and do it on the ferry, go to Costa Rica, the, yeah, the band. There was a, a ferry strike on the French and I couldn't get to the gig, and that was it. Uh, and the Vogue, who was a record company. Now, I'll just tell you who Vogue is very quickly. Vogue was two guys who used to go around with a tape recorder and, and, and tape gigs in pubs. And, uh, and they used to, and they used to always, they always used to tape Django Reinhardt and Stephen Rapello. And that's it. And Roger Hill, that's where it all came, came from. But they were leading French record company. Yeah, they were. And uh, and so they became my record company and the, the, the owner of them took me out from Neil and all the band, Nigel Darby, the keyboard player, who used to be the final cannibals and all that. Mm -hmm. And we all went out from Neil after, after the gig one night in, in Paris. And um, 
and we used to do things like that and um, and it was going swimmingly and then it, for some reason they went from they kind of the guy went bankrupt and so our, our career was at the window with them and uh, so then it, you kind of like but it's the kind of thing that happens in music you get there's very few people who actually have a smooth passage through life in music. but I mean it goes with the territory uh, but the, the, the art of it is always bouncing back and standing up that's the art of it and um, there's we're like a band of brothers, the, the ones that get up and have done it over the years. And, uh, and that's how it, that's really how it could, everybody, lots of people give up. Yeah. It's very profound and very, very true. Um, I'm going to throw it on the floor because I'm, I feel that Andy starts to scratch the surface of John Caswell. But let's, uh, let's interrogate him. Oh. Who's going to go first? Bob Wilson. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell us about your amazing first Telecaster that wasn't a Telecaster, what was it? Oh yeah, we had the Federer Squire. It had an amazing sound, didn't it? Like, that, it, was a, it, was an, it was an Esquire, which was a... What? An Esquire? I'm not telling Bob this, I'm telling all, everybody who doesn't know. An Esquire is a one pickup Telecaster. Telecaster's normally got two pickups on it. Spire's got one, a back. A bit like a Gibson SG, one people. And uh, I bought it off Pete Oliver, who used to have a music shop in Birmingham called Wasp. And uh, perhaps that because he stung you all, I don't know, but we're not And I bought it for uh, £200. And it was candy apple red, it was 1963. And as uh, Bob said, it was the most glorious guitar you'd ever wish to play. It was fantastic. It had a particular sound. It yeah, yeah. Like beautiful, wonderful yeah. sound. Yeah, and I sold it for not a lot more, to be honest with you. And I looked, um, two years ago, I looked on eBay or something. And that, not that same guitar, because I don't know where that is, but if you wanted to buy that, Guitar, yeah. a 1963 Fender Square. It's nine thousand. Ninety thousand. Nine. Nine thousand. But but those are the kind of mistakes you made. Like um, yeah. when I was first in locomotion, uh, and I got a guitar because mine was destroyed in the car crash on the Agra Road. I got a a, a salmon pink Fender Stratocaster. Uh, Probably about 60 something, 60. Worth a lot of money now, but at the time, was was not a, a fortune. Still valuable to tell, but not nothing like that. And I sanded it down. Because I didn't want salmon pink, I wanted wood. I mean, I know other people who've got salmon down. And there's nothing wrong with it, but that's that's what I, those are the kind of things you used to do. And now when you look back, you think, oh, why did I do that? Well, it's always great in hindsight, and it, it lots of things are yeah. But, um, what was the question? <laughs> how, many, uh, how many guitars have you got at the moment? Uh, I was going to say too many, but I know people think you can never have too many. Uh, no, I haven't got that many, actually. I've given a lot away. The men's do you have the I give guitars away. I cannot. So, how many have you got at the moment? Probably about 16. <laughs> But, but some of them are, are really nice guitars, you know. Uh, J200s, Gibson J200s, Gibson, Every Brothers guitars. And, uh, but uh, I can't, I, I can't help it. I'm, uh, there's a word for it. It's all to not the word. Do you play a different guitar to Sorry? Do you do you, do you play a different guitar according to your mood for that day? I have done. Because uh, they all give a different the sound. But the they? trouble is, you see, the trouble is that I buy this guitar and kind of win because I really liked it. Like you'd buy a jacket or a pair of shoes. Then after a bit, I get a bit tired with it. And it goes into a cupboard in a case. And I don't touch it. And, that's, and I start to think, well, that's a waste. 
So I like to get rid of it or give it to a friend or yeah. and I'm kind of like notorious for giving expensive guitars away. But I don't do it willy nilly. I do it to people who I know will appreciate it. And, and call, practice. And call me Stu Lord and Yeah, we'll all form in order to commercial <laughs> We're close to running out of time. Any more questions than that? I came in a bit late, but you went from playing reggae to prog rock. Yes. No, no. It's the other way around. I, I might have done the three, done it like one, done prog rock, reggae, and then prog rock again. Oh, okay. Because the, the one no, thing, of, no, the one thing about music, I'll say what's your name? Chris. Chris. What I'm thinking about music, Chris, is that you're allowed to, a lot of people are telling you you can't do this. Well, I'm telling you you can. You can play whatever you want, whatever style, you can play blues, rock, whatever. It doesn't matter. As long as it's good, and as long as it's, you mean it, and it's from the heart, sincere. That's all that matters. Because that's what people see, and people will buy your records if it's sincere. Like they'll buy Joni Mitchell records because it's sincere. And they won't buy other people's records because they know it's candy floss, and she doesn't really mean it, or he doesn't really mean it. So you've got to be sincere. And that's, that's just, that you can play whatever you want, any kind of music. And all my friends who play, players who have been played. I've all played different styles and I'm capable of playing on different styles. Uh, but they can play like uh, they can play like blues, they can play funk, they can do it like it's all music. And there's nothing there's no, nothing to say that you can't like uh, Wagner composer and or, or the Smiths. There's no there's no rules. The only rule is that it's sincere. I think that's a very yeah. important way to think. I have to say that uh, the Blues Brothers film where Country Bob was asked what sort of music he likes, he said both types of music, country and western. Yeah. <laughs> John? Can I ask one last question? I normally, I'm, I've become a regular here, and the one question I always ask people is, what was the first music that you listened to that inspired you to become a musician but from what you said earlier tonight it was your father who inspired you so can you remember that first moment that either he was playing his music well, you said he played piano well, and or well we had um, in our house in the, my generation we had like um, a front room and a back room yep we did too and, yeah uh, and in the front room, we had a piano, not right piano. And my earliest memories is climbing over drum kits and double basses. And, stuff like that. and, and he'd always sit there and play songs on the piano. And he'd show me roughly how to play something. He was trying to get me interested in the piano originally. Not the, and um, it was things like, um, things that are still wonderful now, like Cole Porter and Ella Fitzgerald. And if you listen to those people now, like it's like 70 years, 80 years, I don't know how long ago. Yeah, but they were still brilliant. But they're still, brilliant. nowadays, you get people trying to copy them like Lady Gaga. And they do all right. Uh, I went to see Tony Bennett not, not long ago, because he's a living legend. And it's the songs, the songwriters who wrote those songs, like uh, Cole Porter. And, and like Bernstein, the music is so it's as good as anything classical. Right? Yeah. It's like wonderful, wonderful music. And so my memory is of uh, yeah. oh, that. That's and, great. And my dad did it. Then a bit of the Beatles. Then what really hit me was the other thing. Right, thank you. We're gonna finish. Yeah.